uh, straggling in after lunch. Uh, my name is Noah Hall. I'm a professor up at Wayne State University in Detroit. Um, and our second panel today is going to focus on the environmental implications of fracking. Uh, rather than waste time with detailed uh, speaker introductions, uh, the really good folks at Case Western Law Review, who've done a fantastic job on the whole event, have put together a great uh, bio, complete with a picture, so if you forget a name with a face, they're all right there. Some of us are starting to look alike a little bit, <laughs> or at least going to the same barber here. You're okay down there. All right. So um, uh, we're going to go through the panel in the order in which they're seated. Um, I'm going to keep their... Uh, prepared remarks to um, uh, 15, 20 minutes each, which will leave us plenty of time for audience questions. We have an exceptionally informed audience today, and I don't want to waste more time getting to them. So um, uh, first up is uh, Professor Robertson. Uh, why don't you just take it away and hear? Okay. I thought I was last. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Yes, thank you. No, 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 no. Whoops, my bad. Sorry. Good to go. I, uh, <laughs> Good to go. <laughs> there you go. Let me go first. Yeah, take it. Uh, that's going to have to work. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tim Fitzgerald, and uh, I am an economist. And I, at one point, wondered why a bunch of attorneys wanted to hear from a dismal scientist. Uh, and then I found out I was right after lunch, so it made a little <laughs> bit more sense. <clears throat> um, I'm going to try to talk about three things. Um, I'm going to try to give a little bit of an overview from sort of a macro view down to a very micro fracture view of the economics of, of uh, fracturing and well completion practices. Um, I think one of the more interesting things I may be able to say is talk about some of my, uh, my colleagues' work and uh, what other economists are working on with respect to natural gas development and hydraulic fracturing in particular. Uh, and then I'm going to try to give a little bit of uh, Western perspective. Uh, I don't know very much of anything about um, Ohio, but I know a little bit about, uh, about the West, and there may be some valuable lessons to be learned uh, from that. So uh, start off from, from what, what has already been said. Uh, so the technology of fracturing is a completion technology. It's what we do after the well bore is drilled. Uh, and it is exp the, the combination of hydraulic fracturing with directional drilling, horizontal drilling, uh, has expanded the reserves. And it, it's, it's worth taking a minute to, to explain the economic terms. Okay, we can talk about resources, the total amount of hydrocarbon that exists in the world. It is obviously finite. Okay, we distinguish that from an economic reserve, which is the amount of resource that can be extracted profitably at today's prices with today's technology. So obviously thinking about hydraulic fracturing as a technological change has changed the reserve base and it's also led to expanded production which is the flow from the resource that we get. If we look at uh, U.S. proved reserves for both crude oil and natural gas uh, you'll notice that in the last few years we've had a, a tremendous uh, uptick in the amount of reserve uh, particularly for natural gas, that gets called the natural gas revolution, the game changer, uh, whatever sort of moniker you want to put on it. And there is just as much excitement about the, the rapid increase in unconventional oil production, which uses many of the same technologies. Uh, that's certainly a hot topic out in, in my part of the world, uh, in the Bakken Formation in the Williston Basin. That's been translated into... Uh, Production differences, so the, the red line here is, is crude oil. We've had a, a long, slow, inexorable de decline uh, for the most part in uh, depleted oil and natural gas uh, reservoirs, crude oil reservoirs in the United States since they peaked in 1970. Uh, but here in the last uh, couple, of, couple of years, these are monthly data, so uh, you see a little bit more variation. But... Um, this last little uptick here in the last year or so is what has led uh, Citigroup and others to uh, linearly extrapolate and project that we will surpass Saudi Arabia uh, in crude oil production. Uh, but we've, we've also seen increases in, in natural gas production. So, so, so if you want to think about the longer term trends, although this technology was developed, uh, George Mitchell gets all the credit uh, for, for developing the Barnett Shale. There were others. 
uh, who helped, helped perfect these technologies. Um, in the past four or five years, operators have, have spent a lot of time chasing what were called liquid ri rich plays, okay, not just chasing uh, natural gas, but looking for natural gas liquids and other types of hydrocarbons that are found in the same uh, shale reservoirs to try to, to maximize the economic value of the product, okay? And that has been uh, in places like the Eagleford Shale down in South Texas and in, in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. Uh, that, that liquid rich has, has gone all the way to crude oil, uh, where the Bakken is, is mostly producing a, a light, sweet, grade of crude that commands a price premium in the market. Um, I can talk a little bit more uh, about how the, the relative prices of natural gas liquids and, and dry natural gas have changed uh, over the last uh, couple of years. The, the, the trends are that the market is reacting to uh, the search for liquids. Okay, so I want to take just a minute, uh, thanks to my, my friends at Montana Tech, and think about what what the marginal value or the value of actually using fracturing on uh, a completed well bore is. So you've got a, a picture there of two horizontal well bores, and I, I use some, some numbers uh, that, that are representative of a well from the Bakken formation where we have 8,000 feet of horizontally drilled borehole. Okay? Uh, so most of, our, most of the, the wells in the Bakken are approximately nine or 10,000 feet down vertically. And then you turn the corner from, uh, to, to a horizontal string that extends usually around 8,000 feet. And if we imagine perforating that, uh, that string uh, every eight inches, the conventional oil and gas well would just use those perforations as the avenue from the reservoir rock or the, uh, into the well bore, but by fracturing we can expand the surface area that is exposed to the well bore by creating fractures and cracks uh, through those perforations. And for a typical uh, multi, granted this is a multi-stage uh, frack, uh, this would be uh, something where you were, you were fracturing about uh, 400 feet of that lateral string at a time, so about a 20-stage frack. Uh, you would increase the surface area of the, ro of the rock that now has a direct channel into the well bore by 3,200 times, which if you were to make an assumption on, say, linear flow out of the reservoir, that would increase your initial production rate commensurately. Um, now, in the, in, this is a sort of a, a representative central tendency number. If, if I'd have been given this talk a year ago, we would have talked about 30 or 40 stage fracks. Uh, operators have been reducing the number of stages and the amount of fracturing that they have actually done on their horizontal well bores uh, in the Bakken as they've tried to limit uh, the cost that they incur, uh, trading off the increased production with the cost of the well servicing uh, for completion. But as that increased flow comes into the well bore and increases the initial production of the well, uh, the, the internal rate of return or, or the, the profitability of uh, these well investments goes up. Uh, that is over the longer run or the life of the well that's offset, although the, the, the unconventional wells come in at a very high rate of production initially, they decline uh, more quickly than a conventional well will, uh, particularly over the first uh, 12 to 30 months of the life of the well. So from an investment point of view, it's very important to operators that they see a financial return before the, the production uh, is reduced to a level at which it uh, flattens out. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. I want to think about what it costs okay, to, to actually use the hydraulic fracturing completion technology. Okay, uh, if we think about going back 10 years, uh, some, some numbers for 60% for of new oil wells and 90% of new natural gas wells were fractured at that point in time. Virtually all are today. I, I can't find when I, uh, the, the states that I look at most often are, are Montana and Wyoming, and it's, it's very hard for me to find a well that is not completed with a fracture job. Um, and so if we want to think about the large productivity gains that we get from fracturing the rock 
around the well bore, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging exercise, uh, accounting exercise or evaluation exercise, but sort of back of the envelope again for a Bakken well that's going to cost somewhere between six and ten million dollars all in. Uh, the, the costs of just the fracturing part are about a quarter. And it does vary a little bit by completion. It had, cre it had crept up into the 30 to 35 percent range uh, as operators were trying to make uh, more, put more stages in their fracks, uh, try to increase the pressure more. Um, but it's very difficult to account for the types of contractual variation that occur between uh, the operators and, and it's, remember that the, the well servicing industry is fairly highly concentrated. Uh, that's something else I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, there, there aren't very many firms that do this. These are long-term contracts. They're complicated contracts with farm ends and participation agreements, uh, field-wide contracts that, that last over a period of years. So it's very hard for us to put a dollar figure on, well, here's what it costs to fracture a well and here's what you get out of it. But when we look at the aggregated data for drilling costs, we see about the same time that there's a huge increase in the use, use of hydraulic fracturing completion, we see a huge increase in the drilling costs uh, on average. Okay, so one question we'd have is if it's expensive to fracture and our initial production declines immediately, uh, does it pay off? And so now I'm going to show you a schematic of probably the most famous U.S shale gas well. It's down in the Barnett Shale. Uh, it was drilled in 1993 and you can see the decline in the, the monthly production over the subsequent seven years or so and then the operator went back in and performed another completion, refractured the well. And you'll notice that in mid-2000 the production rate went right back to the initial production rate. And they began a, another decline over time well, they re-entered this well uh, again. This, this graph actually ends in 2010. Shortly after that, they re-entered it again, recompleted it, and the production went right back to the initial production rate. That has the potential to very much change the landscape of uh, oil and gas production, wherein you don't have to go drill a new well to get more production. You take the same well bore, the same infrastructure that you've invested in, and you return with a uh, convoy of semis and you can see that the initial estimated ultimate recovery was uh, 1 billion cubic feet. By the time they had uh, recompleted the well, that number had increased almost threefold. Okay, uh, another point I would make, I've, I've been a little bit uh, uh, cavalier, I suppose, in describing the uh, the technology, it's, it's constantly evolving. So the Bakken, the Bakken formation uh, was initially developed in the 1950s. It was rediscovered with the advantages of uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing in 2006 in the Elm Cooley field in Montana. And it was only after drilling those wells and, and having them perform very well that operators began looking at the geology of western North Dakota and, and the rigs have moved to North Dakota. And at this time, there's been an awful lot more development in the Bakken field on the North Dakota side of the line. Um, but when, and this is only six years ago, every, every job that they did on those initial Elm Cooley wells, they didn't even run uh, production casing down all the way down the string. They were open hole fracture. So you drill a, a well bore down there, you run a perforating gun down, shoot some holes in it, and then just fill the hole with water and see what it does. Well, they ended up with free flowing oil wells, which turned out to be hugely profitable. Now, Today, if we go back and we look at, you know, we have about 25 rigs working in Montana, most of them in the Bakken. Almost all of those have a closed hole completion so that they can do a multi-stage frack. Okay, so that, uh, as I said earlier, they were up to where they were doing 30 or 40 stages in those fracks, but now they've backed off. And uh, the petroleum engineers and the geologists are always communicating with each other, trying to uh, figure out what the most profitable formula is uh, but by, by investing in additional pipe and cement along that horizontal string in your, in your well, you have the ability to be much more precise in how you complete that well and control the production over time. Uh, my guess is that our, our last panel will talk more about the regulatory environment. 
Um, I would just draw your attention to sort of the top of this. Resources for the Future has a very nice set of visually appealing maps uh, pertaining to the, to the different state level regulations uh, for, for natural gas wells. I wanted to talk just a minute about uh, some, some other economists working on uh, the use of hydraulic fracturing. One of these is uh, Chermak and, and Crafton and Patrick. This is a new paper that's come out. These are, these are, these are the people who brought you the, uh, the cost function for natural gas wells. Uh, and, and what they've found is they've begun to examine a sample of both vertical and horizontally drilled but uh, fracture completions is they found uh, very different productivity impacts for hydraulic fracturing. So the use of the completion technology differs dramatically between vertical wells, such as those you might find in a place like Pinedale, Wyoming, Pinedale Anticline, and horizontal wells like you would find uh, in the Marcellus or, or any other shale formation. The other sort of interesting point uh, when you start talking about fracturing fluid is they find that replacing a traditional surfactant, which is one of the additives uh, in a fracturing fluid, with a complex nanofluid, uh, which is one of the uh, sort of mystery trade secrets. Uh, and they just, they, they're not actually allowed to distinguish in the paper, given the data that they have, between the various complex nanofluids. They find huge productivity increases with these additives. Okay, so the, the service crews are very protective of their trade secrets, but it seems as though they have marked productivity impacts. Uh, it should be said that that is a fairly small sample. Uh, turning to a different kind of study that's a little bit closer to home, this is, uh, there was some, some property uh, transaction data that was made available from Washington County, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's widely studied. Uh, there are two papers that have looked at it. Uh, I'm happy to talk at length later with any of you who are interested in this, but uh, the, uh, the paper from RFF, the first paper there, uh, found that drilling actually increases property values in Washington County, unless you use a groundwater well, okay? And in that case, if you use a groundwater well, the, the net impact is negative, okay? So you have to be a little bit careful. That stands in, in somewhat contrast to uh, Alan Kleiber down at uh, The Ohio State University. He looked at the same data and found that, that everybody was negatively impacted, but, but had a much smaller price effect uh, in the property market. Um, let me just take one minute and talk about uh, Pavilion, Wyoming, which, is, which has been held up as, a, as the place where we're going to find out that hydraulic fracturing fluid gets into groundwater wells. Okay? Uh, you can just look at these physical parameters and see this is very different numbers than you see in the eastern shales and you see in the Barnett. Okay? These are very shallow wells. They're fractured very close to the surface and the groundwater happens to be very deep and full of methane, okay? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different um, than, than most other places. So in 2008, landowner complaints led the EPA to uh, uh, a com comprehensive groundwater investigation, okay? And there was a draft report, came out almost a year ago now. It's been uh, fairly uh, controversial. And there was some, some evidence that there were possibly fracture fluids or other completion products in the aquifer that were found in the monitoring wells EPA drilled. Uh, and this was touted in the press, particularly by environmental organizations, as here is the missing proof. Uh, the other shoe is beginning to drop. Uh, and so industry, including Encana, who's the operator for the field, um, had, had a, a number of complaints. Um, and the, the, the really sort of problematic for EPA uh, uh, fact was that the USGS went in and looked at the, the data from the wells and found that there were discrepancies in the data that EPA had collected. Uh, the earlier speaker was happy to have had a September date. I got 10 days ago. Okay, EPA has, has revised uh, their results uh, as of the 6th of November and they have backed away from some of their conclusions from the draft report. The, the final report is expected out, uh, but is likely to be a little bit less uh, problematic for, for uh, 
uh, or, or a little bit less conclusive, perhaps, would be the right way to put it, about, about the effects of hydraulic fracturing on, on groundwater. Let me try to wrap up since I've grossly disrespected the time limits that were imposed upon me. Um, there are a lot of risks in oil and gas development for uh, oil and gas operators. Okay. Uh, we can think about the ownership of these risks. I think Professor Gerhardt hit on this point. I think this is great. Who, who owns the risks that come from gas development broadly? Uh, but I would suggest that, that fracking just happens to be the convenient villain that is really associated with we're worried about a broader set of changes that natural gas development brings to our community, okay? And we're gonna, we need to have a face for that. Fracturing itself, it's just a completion technology. It, it, it's, it's sort of interesting. It has some, some big uh, uh, productivity impacts, but instead of implicating the, the drillers or the land mineral owners or anybody else, uh, Halliburton is the poster child. Halliburton and the other service companies are the poster child children for, for, for fracking. And, and that, that makes it uh, a salient point uh, that, that people can focus their, their energies on. Thank you very much. Next speaker is going to be uh, Professor Nick Trek from Wayne State University. <clears throat> Thank you. It's uh, great to be in Cleveland. I'm a big Detroit Lions fan, and normally when I travel around the region, I take a lot of abuse. But being here, I feel like a little bit of sympathy, and um, it's it's just it's nice. Uh, and <laughs> so if you ever want to commiserate with me, I'm happy to happy to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit today about potential impacts to mainly water quality issues and water quantity issues with a particular focus on the Great Lakes. Um, I do a lot of work on Great Lakes issues, invasive species, water quality, um, energy related issues as well. And um, this is something that has come up time and again is questions about protection of the Great Lakes, protection of our surface waters and also our, our groundwater in the region. So there's kind of two overall themes I want you to think about as I, I go through my remarks. And the first is that something that really hasn't come up yet today, and that's the amount of water that we're using uh, per frac job. Uh, and I don't know if these numbers are consistent all across the country, but I know that in like the Antrim Shale, where um, Michigan and some of the Collingwood Shale, develop, shale plays, we're talking between two and three to seven to 10 million gallons of water per frack job, and um, as Professor Fitzgerald pointed out, I mean, they can be fracked multiple times. So it is a lot of water, even when we're on the shores of Lake Erie here, where it's obviously a, a amazing big resource of water, but it is something to think about that we are talking about massive quantities of water. The second overall theme is that once this water has been used for a fracturing operation, it really can't be returned to the normal consumptive water use cycle. Uh, typically it's disposed of in injection wells and, and kept there in that environment. So a lot of water, and we're removing water from our normal water cycle the way that we, that we use it. One other quick point to hit on before I uh, progress is that we do have some regulatory tools or environmental protections on the books that could help answer some of these questions, could offer a layer of protection, but for whatever reason, oil and gas development has been exempted from those laws. Um, one to think about in particular is the Safe Drinking Water Act, which deals with protection of surface waters, but also groundwater aquifers that provide drinking water to, to humans, and also for cattle, agriculture, that type of thing. Um, I would encourage you to look at that law and to look at how this exemption came to be, and you can draw your own conclusions as to how that happened. But it's a pretty good law. It requires some, some data, some studies, some input before the, the drilling would actually uh, commence. And for whatever reason, there's an exemption there for oil and gas development. Okay. Um, and I'm just gonna take off a few other environmental issues and then I'm gonna return to the Great Lakes specifically. So it's, some of these have already been hit on today, but um, you know, water supply and scarcity is not just an issue here. It's an issue all across the country. We had record droughts this summer. Um, 
question of whether or not we should be using the water for oil and gas development or if we should be using it for agriculture and for human consumption. The other question is about where are we withdrawing that water from? Arguably, there are areas that are critical habitat for whether it's endangered species or just wildlife in general. Perhaps those areas of water resources should be made off limits from withdrawals for, for this type of activity. Storage and disposal of the wastewater from a fracking operation is also a big issue. States treat their disposal wells differently. They have different requirements. Some are treated like a brine well. Others are kind of a more closely regulated injection well. Some states haven't figured that out yet, and uh, we're, we're still in that ongoing discussion. Another issue, again, was touched on briefly this morning, is associated air pollution from the wells themselves, whether it's leaking methane as part of the drilling operation. Also, there are some not entirely insignificant localized impacts from the use of heavy machinery, from the use of trucks and tractors and bulldozers and that type of thing. Um, fine particulate matter impacts in some of these areas that are otherwise sort of open natural areas where we have heavy industry coming in, even for a short period of time, it can have some localized impact with uh, air pollution from the machinery. Another big theme, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, perhaps the next panel will, is the disclosure requirements or lack thereof, public notice requirements or lack thereof, regarding oil and gas development in general, fracturing in particular. Um, I've had some students, I've assigned them research questions. Hey, what, what type of notice is required in Michigan for a well that's about to be developed? And it's kind of a, a funny question because they come back inevitably and say, I don't know, I can't find anything. And there are some small requirements, but you know, it, it could be that you, you see the, the trucks come in and, and that's when you get your notice. Um, so there's, there's, there's questions about that. Ideally, the public would be involved in the permitting process, at least have notice about it before the, welling the well drilling commences. Uh, one other thing that, that gets very limited attention is uh, sand, sand mining. Uh, something here in the Great Lakes that we do have an abundance of, particularly in the northern Great Lakes. Uh, big impacts in Wisconsin from the, the fracturing boom in sand mining. And uh, there's associated health impacts potentially from fine silica. Uh, people breathing that in, but also just, just the, the fact that we're digging up sand, whether it's in a, a mining type operation or a dune environment, or dredging from the lakes themselves and you know, shipping it elsewhere to be used for fracturing. I talked about public disclosure for the drilling itself, but the other disclosure issue is the type of chemicals that are used in fracking operations. Uh, Another exemption that you can look up is the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act, which would tell us uh, what type of chemicals are being used, what type of, at least first responders have notice of what's going through the pipes so that if there is an accident, we can deal with human health issues right off the bat. Uh, ideally, again, there would at least be disclosure that would give us an idea of what type of impacts there may be to a groundwater or surface water if the unthinkable happens, an accident happens. Um, and again, ideally, this disclosure would take place before the drilling operation commences. Uh, I'm not completely familiar with, with Ohio's regulations, but I know in Michigan, a lot of these chemicals are required to be reported on a material safety data sheet. Uh, but most of that is not up for public disclosure. So uh, perhaps our Department of Environmental Quality might know most of what's in there, but the public uh, is kind of left, left wondering. Well integrity is another big question that we have, making sure that we use the industry best practices in all these drilling operations uh, to ensure that we can prevent a lot of these, these uh, potential pitfalls from happening. And then the final thing before we turn to the Great Lakes is just noise. We talked a little bit about torts this morning, but uh, noise is definitely a form of pollution. Folks in rural communities are sometimes surprised at the amount of truck traffic and noise that uh, is associated with, with these operations, infrastructure issues, roads, bridges, you know, who's going to pay for, the, for that road to be fixed up after the tanker trucks go back and forth with all their, their water. Okay, back to the Great Lakes. So as part of the symposium, I'm working on an article with one of my former students, uh, Stephanie Karizny, and we're looking at 
perhaps a new approach to dealing with fracturing regulations here in the Great Lakes region, and that is dealing with a vehicle that we already have, and that is the Great Lakes Compact. I'm sure that folks in Ohio are pretty familiar with what the debate that's been going on with the Compact implementation as far as water withdrawals are concerned. Uh, so I'll just give a quick overview of what the Compact is, and, and then we'll get into the issues. So the Compact is an agreement amongst the eight Great Lakes states. They all passed exactly the same piece of legislation through their state houses and state senates, went on, and then it also had to be, identical language had to be passed by the U.S. Congress, Senate, House, Senate, and then signed by President Bush in 2008. So pretty remarkable that we were able to get all eight Great Lakes states on board, passing the same thing all the way through their legislatures. There's also an important companion agreement with Ontario and Quebec. So the two Canadian provinces that share the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. Now, the compact and the agreement both do some important things. First of all, they treat groundwater and surface water as essentially the same resource, right? In many areas, they are hydrologically connected, but it's treated as the same resource for purposes of, of regulation under the compact. Now, it protects groundwater, the compact protects groundwater and surface water in, in three important ways. One is that all of the parties have to manage Great Lakes Basin water withdrawals under a decision-making standard. It's set out in the compact what you have to think about, what analysis a state or provincial agency must undertake when deciding whether or not a new or increased water withdrawal can occur. It establishes some baseline practices for water conservation and also uh, sustainable use. So that, that's, again, it's written right there in the compact. Another important thing that the compact and agreement does is that there is a ban on new or increased diversions of water out of the Great Lakes Basin. So out of that kind of soup bowl of the Great Lakes Basin, if you wanted to divert water by truck, train, pipeline to another part of the country or even just outside the basin, by and large, that's prohibited. There are some limited exceptions, which I won't get into, but by and large, that's prohibited. And, and maybe you can start thinking about why that might be an issue with uh, large water withdrawal oil and gas development in, in the region. So we'll come back to that. Finally, the compact and agreement require that the member, member states and provinces have to implement water efficiency and conservation programs at the state and provincial level. They also have to report data. They have to collect data about water withdrawals, water use, and submit it to this compact council that was created by the compact. So that's a good thing. We can track. We can track when we have um, potential adverse resource impacts through too much water withdrawals. We can look basin-wide at how much water is being withdrawn, how much is being consumed. We can collect that kind of data, and we can make it publicly available. So, as I mentioned previously, you know, fracking requires the use of millions of gallons of water, and it has the potential to cause a significant water depletion issue, and there is the potential for aquifer contamination. So, our article, we kind of what we do is we look at a brief overview of federal regulations, or the lack thereof, both in the U.S. and Canada. We also look at a particular focus on Michigan and Ontario, and how that state and province are dealing with regulation of hydraulic fracturing. So then what we look at is this ban on new or increased diversions. Now, diversions in the compact really means here's the line. Over this line, if you move the water, that's prohibited by the compact. But I'll float perhaps a tenuous legal argument out there that if you are taking water out of the Great Lakes Basin, you are using it for a frac fracturing process, you have basically 100% consumption of that water, it cannot be returned, to the Great Lakes Basin, it is in an injection well, has that water not, in, in a sense at least, been taken out of the Great Lakes Basin? I think there's an argument to be made there. Again, the compact is clear that we're talking about moving water from Lake Erie to Arizona, okay? But there's a, a, an argument to be made that this type of use potentially could be construed as a diversion. But what I think it's more important is to look at that consumptive use. Right? So the compact also says that, yeah, you can get a permit to withdraw water. The issue is, though, that once you've used it for whatever purpose it is, making your, your car or, or uh, beer, whatever it is, returning water, less consumptive use, back into the source watershed. Okay? So if you withdraw your water from Lake Erie, you're supposed to take whatever you need for your consumptive use and then return water back to the Lake Erie watershed. 
So what I'm getting at there is that if we're not returning any water, is that, is that just a, a consumptive use or is it something different? Perhaps that's a problem with the compact, the way it's drafted right now. We may need to revisit looking at those types of uses. Because again, this is, when this was being written, 2004, 2005, this type of uh, drilling activity wasn't really considered. So potential, I think, for a diversion question and also for this consumptive use point. So what, what I would suggest is that there's this compact council that was created out of the Great Lakes Compact. Representatives of the governors of each state get together, they meet regularly to review each state's water conservation and efficiency programs, to review the implementing legislation that they have for each, each state to implement the compact. So perhaps a suggestion could be made to this compact council that they need to look at this question of hydraulic fracturing, they need to look at the question of water use possibility of contamination of groundwater or surface water from fracturing. And luckily, they have the ability to promulgate some rules. They have the ability as a compact council to just come up with some rules, regulations, and implement them, which would then be binding for the Great Lakes Basin states. Only the portion of those states that's within the Great Lakes Basin. So you, do, you will, of course, like all of Ohio isn't covered by the compact, right? Just that, that portion that's within the Lake Erie Basin. But something to think about that they may have the ability to address some of these questions. And every five years, this Compact Council reviews states' water conservation and efficiency programs, okay? Uh, advocacy at the state level, talking to our water resource managers about these concerns, all of that can be kind of sent up the chain to the Compact Council, or we can go directly to the Com Compact Council and recommend that states increase their um, conservation and efficiency programs specifically dealing with uh, oil and gas development. So that's basically just to kind of sum up some sort of new rule for basically 100% consumptive use, taking water out of, out of the Great Lakes Basin, um, some advocacy with this vehicle that we already have, right? It was a heavy lift to get this compact passed. I think it's a, a pathway for us to be engaged and to hopefully see some positive uh, environmental protections placed here, here in, the, in the region. I'll just close with saying that, you know, there's always people look at the Great Lakes and they say, wow, what an amazing, ridiculous amount of water. And it is. Um, how many quadrillion gallons do we have? It's, it's a lot of water, okay? But the point is, they're only renewed about 1% annually through rainwater, snowmelt. Um, so it's not like a river flowing out to the Atlantic Ocean, as some people claim. Most of this stuff is left, this water is left over from the glaciers when they were treated. So it's a resource that you have a potential to, if there's a major incident, pipeline spill or otherwise, to impact not only states, but also um, our neighbors to the north in Canada. So again, huge international resource, but I think we owe it to ourselves, but also to, to be a, a sort of a representative of, of good environmental stewards to the rest of the country, showing how we're managing this uh, wonderful resource that we've been blessed with. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll sit down. Thank you. Uh, last, certainly not least, Professor Robertson. Let me see if our PowerPoint's working nice and slick. There you go. Take it away. I don't know how slick it is, but um, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, grateful to the Case Law Review students. Thank you for inviting me uh, here to speak today. I'm here to talk about uh, lessons, I say lessons that should have been learned from the Gulf Coast oil spill and how they should inform uh, the developing regulation of hydraulic fracturing in Ohio. Uh, I had the pleasure last fall of team teaching a seminar course on legal issues surrounding the Gulf Coast oil spill with um, uh, Maureen Brennan from Baker Haw, the firm of Baker Hostetler here in uh, Cleveland. Um, we worked with our students uh, to identify the lessons uh, that could be learned um, from the circumstances surrounding that disaster. Uh, and at the same time, of course, the various government commissions were doing the same thing. Uh, also at the same time, Ohio was racing full speed ahead into the development of its shale oil and gas reserves. Uh, so. Today, I'll be talking about three small subsets of the lessons learned from the BP experience 
and we'll talk about whether those lessons are also present in Ohio. Um, you know, when you talk about the, the BP spill, it was uh, of enormous magnitude. Uh, some of you probably saw the news yesterday that there was a, a criminal judgment against um, BP and uh, of, what was it, four point something billion dollars. Uh, so people pay attention when you talk about a disaster of that magnitude. So we'll take some lessons from those because people are listening when you talk about BP and see if we can uh, apply them to um, uh, what's going on here. So there are lots of lessons, obviously, to be learned from the Gulf Coast spill. Uh, quite understandably, government uh, task forces have been filling whole books of them. Uh, I'm only focusing on a few lessons uh, pointed out in those reports because among the many, they raise concerns that might apply as we quickly develop the shale oil and gas industry uh, here in Ohio. Um, so as we look back at the BP spill, I'm going to focus on three areas of concern. Uh, agency issues, um, inadequacy of research, and preparedness for disaster. Okay, so within agency issues, I'm going to talk about conflict of interest within the regulatory agency um, that made it hard for it to function rationally. Uh, in a way that would prevent the disaster. Uh, and also within the uh, subject area of agency issues, uh, and as its former director has mentioned time uh, and again, I'll discuss the fact that inadequacies of uh, funding um, and a disproportionate focus on the revenue generation side of the agency helped lead the agency astray from one of its primary areas of responsibility, which should have been safety. Um, with respect to the research inadequacies, I'll be talking about how rapidly changing technologies enabled drillers to reach deeper and deeper into the water, and how it was not well enough understood how uh, the cleanup plans would work in the environmental conditions that were at hand, and the fact that there was uh, information readily available that could have indicated a pressure problem, but nobody really stopped long enough or slowed down long enough, um, you know, slowed the relentless march towards production uh, before it was too late. Um, I'll also talk about some issues in emergency preparedness, specifically safety training on the rig itself. Um, lack of clarity within and among the various chains of command, and uh, an insufficiency of ready resources on the ground or water uh, to implement even the inadequate uh, cleanup contingencies that were in place. So um, MMS, the place where it all began, this is the agency uh, about which we'll identify our first set of lessons. Uh, it, it visually, if, if you look there, it visually states the uh, obvious. Um, it was a department or service within the US Department of Interior. You can see that right there on the seal. You can learn plenty, though, by just looking at its seal. You know, clearly, it's a government department with the red, white, and blue, and the eagle and all. Um, but if you look at the white ribbon that surrounds it, it states the tripartite responsibilities that, uh, with which the agency, a single agency, was saddled. Uh, and it says mineral revenues, stewardship, and offshore minerals. So remember the symbolism of this seal as we talk about internal conflict of interest at MMS. Um, Okay, so I foreshadowed this on the previous slide. Um, the three conflicting missions of the agency, as articulated by the department itself, were um, outer continental shelf resource management. Let's see where I'm going here. Uh, safety and environmental oversight and enforcement, and revenue collection. So talk a little bit about each of those. 
In terms of resource management, MMS oversaw a five-year Outer Continental Shelf oil and gas leasing program. Uh, it managed the leasing of the oil and Outer Continental Shelf resources, including marketing, provision of information, and decisions regarding the allocation of leases. So it had a lot of control over leasing. Um, in addition to a couple of kinds of congressional appropriations, MMS also got revenue from collections derived from Outer Continental Shelf rental receipts uh, that MMS was authorized to retain, inspection fees for Outer Continental Shelf facilities, cost recovery fees. Um, MMS even retained a portion um, of revenues generated through royalties in kind, that is, you know, operations to uh, cover some administrative costs. So that actually piece means that MMS was receiving uh, oil and gas revenues in kind, which is, means product. They were receiving product rather than, in, than cash and competitively selling it, those commodities on the marketplace. Uh, it took in an average of $13 billion in minerals revenue. Uh, I, I could give you lots and lots of numbers on how much money that the agency was bringing into the U.S. Treasury, but I'll uh, save that. And suffice to say at this point that at the same time MMS was taking in cash for the Federal Treasury, it was also promulgating the rules that governed offshore shore drilling, and it was handling the inspection of those drilling operations. And I don't know about you, but perhaps rather than guarding the hen house, the fox was living within the hen house. It was right inside. Um, I think I'm going to skip that chart, which you can't even see. Uh, so immediately after the blowout in the Gulf, it became abundantly clear that the fox could no longer live within the hen house and earn its keep by selling eggs. So <laughs> one of the first um, actions that was taken uh, during, you know, immediately following was the reorganization of MMS. Uh, in fact, the complete dismantling of the, of the agency. And during the months that followed the disaster, the director oversaw a complete overhaul of MMS. Uh, they created um, uh, immediately uh, separate agencies and clarified those individual agencies' now divided missions. Um, and you can see the three uh, agencies that were, com that were uh, created, um, and they had separated the, mission, the, the missions that had been living in the, the same building. Um, okay, so there were other issues having to do with conflict of interest that I will go through quite quickly. Um, one of them is uh, what you call, what you'll commonly hear referred to as the revolving door uh, problem. The employees from industry went back, you know, came out, went in, out of the agency, back into industry, had a very close relationship with industry. They were basically regulating their friends and their former coworkers and their employers, former employers. Now, you know, all you law students and lawyers are well aware that the revolving door is a very common problem. Um, MMS was not and is not alone in um, that regard, but it's a very hard nut to crack if you think about where the expertise lives. Um, okay, another closely, you know, another related problem just because it has to do with agencies, though not necessarily a conflict of interest, is just inadequacy of funding. And the inadequacy of funding at MMS led to not enough inspections, not enough resources to do the research um, that was needed for perhaps more responsible uh, enforcement and decision making. Okay, so uh, in terms of the regulation of shale oil and gas drilling in Ohio, unlike the old federal system that applied to the regulation of deep water <laughs> drilling in the Gulf, um, that is, they had a single agency that governed the three conflicting tasks. In Ohio, ODNR, the Department of Natural Resources, really only, you know, controls one of those three areas, uh, though it's a big one. Uh, although Ohio law declares in no uncertain terms that ODNR's Division of Oil and Gas Resources Management 
has sole and exclusive authority, and I say it that way because they say it a lot, you know, several times in the statute, and they really want to be clear we understand sole and exclusive authority. Um, it does not con handle leasing. It controls uh, the regulation. It doesn't control leasing, which uh, is privately negotiated in Ohio, does not involve federal land, um, and it does not collect revenues. These functions are handled, uh, as I said, privately in the case of leasing and by the Ohio Tax Commissioner in the case of revenue. So whereas drilling in the Gulf was done on federally controlled land, there is almost no federal land in Ohio. Um, leases are entered into by the drilling companies through landmen or, or brokers. Drillers often, um, drilling often occurs on land owned by local governments. Uh, still, whatever, the entities enter into leases directly with the company. So it's a very different system. And ODNR really doesn't get involved, except to the extent that they provide a little bit of only semi-useful advice to landowners on their uh, website about what to expect. Uh, it's very limited use if you've looked at it. Tax, with respect to the tax and revenue collection, severance taxes apply uh, when Ohio's natural resources are severed from Ohio. Um, but those are imposed by the legislature and uh, collected by the tax commissioner. They've made news lately, um, mostly because of a controversy over how high the severance taxes should be and what they should be used for. Um, but ODNR has nothing to do with it. It doesn't set them. It doesn't collect them. Um, what ODNR does do is set the regulations as directed under its sole and exclusive authority um, to, from the legislature, and it enforces them. Um, you know, our, our neighboring states are struggling with the sole and exclusive authority uh, issue now. They're also home state rules. Um, that's an issue having to do with local regulation, which is something I'd love to talk about another day. Uh, but uh, that's a different panel for another day. Uh, OK, the other topics I was going to talk about, and we'll see how far I get, is um, just research issues. So you're sort of moving on to research uh, issues that apply, you know, lessons that we've learned. Um, you know, if you think what was going on in the Gulf, there was a lot of there were a lot of technological advances happening that allowed drillers to get deeper and deeper into deep water, you know, into the water. Um, you know, the technical advances that were at play in the Gulf, uh, in most ways, were a great thing. They allowed drilling, you know, allowed us to go deeper, but they left some holes in the knowledge base that proved dangerous. Um, so, you know, there was advanced GPS that allowed rigs to be more stable immediately over uh, the drilling wells, led to deeper drilling. There were advances in 3D seismic imaging. Um, but despite some of these technological advances, um, some important things weren't done, that, such as, you know, we, they still don't have um, automatic shutoffs based on computer readings that would have, you know, could have averted the disaster in the first place. It seems like a relatively simple thing to have implemented, but in a, in a context where there was so really technical important advances, some simple stuff just wasn't focused on and wasn't done. Um, there were issues with um, research to determine the cause of a, of a kick that had happened, a change in pressure that led to the explosion. There was a lot of information available about as to why that happened. And you know, as I said earlier, there was such a push to move to completion and production of the well that they really just didn't slow down and find out what exactly caused that kick, that pressure change. To, it had happened a month earlier. They didn't stop to find out what caused it. And that's the kind of lesson that you hope will be brought to Ohio when a problem arises. Let's stop. Let's find out what caused it so that we don't have a, a problem that happens, you know, a, a more serious problem. Um, there was a lot of lack of clarity regarding uh, the use of the dispersants that were used after the uh, blowout occurred. Uh, we still, there's still a lot of uh, uncertainty in terms of um, how those dispersants work and what their long-term effects would be. There was dramatic, dramatic underestimation of the flow rate 
and therefore the amount of the spill. Um, and I think those are all issues that you know could apply. Well, those are some pictures that I won't bother with right now. They're kind of cool, but. Um, uh, so how does that apply to uh, Ohio? Um, let's see where I've gotten to. Um, you know, it's all moving fairly quickly here in Ohio and difficult to predict where the research inadequacies will lie. Um, but still, we know that there have been um, researcher-related issues that raise concerns. You know, one is the underground injection of the wastewater. Um, obviously, it's not related to the drilling itself. It's a byproduct of drilling. But we, you know, as we've heard other speakers talk about, um, we're using huge amounts of water, and it has to go someplace. We're injecting waste uh, fracturing fluid uh, of somewhat unknown composition. And we're experiencing some small earthquakes that some researchers say are related. Um, and perhaps this is an area for additional research. Uh, sources of water, uh, I was going to talk about that, but you've heard a lot about it. There's a, certainly an area for additional research. Cleanup is a, a big area where we need, we need more research on how cleanup, okay, now he's serious. <laughs> cleanup will be carried out when an accident occurs. Uh, you know, companies are supposed to write individual SPCC plans in compliance with federal law, but you know, they're not available, not well available to the public, and we don't have any way of really verifying whether the plans are adequate in and of themselves, or that local response teams, response crews that would have to deal with uh, an accident are uh, prepared either for worst case scenarios or they have sufficient resources. So I'm just going to encompass my next bit. I'm not even going to go through the Gulf stuff here, all that. See all those emergency response and cleanup related issues. Um, so we'll just stick to the, the, the emergency and cleanup issue that concerns me is um, what we saw in the Gulf is there were plans. They weren't very good. Some of them were just cut and paste from cleanup plans from Alaska. They mentioned things like walruses that don't exist in the Gulf. Um, but uh, you know, here, we don't know what the plans say. And one of the issues that arose in the Gulf is the companies were relying on on the ground or on the water resources. They were going to rely on local boats to come in and you know work on. But there, it turned out they actually never really counted the boats that were in the area or whether the, the boat owners or operators had the training that they needed to uh, do the cleanup that was required. So there wasn't enough focus on whether the on the ground or water uh, resources that were being relied upon were um, numerous, sufficient, or you know resourced or trained, and that's the same. That's another example of a kind of problem that could occur here, whether you know local um, cleanup authorities are ready. Okay, we'll skip that and we'll just go to the dramatic picture <laughs> and say let's not let that happen here. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, let's do questions the way we had been doing it before with folks coming to the microphone so that way the, uh, the webcasting captures everything. Any questions for our panelists? Sure, why don't you got to come right down to that one. Perfect. I have a question. So, so you, you were talking indirectly uh, about, I think, the Halliburton loophole in, in your conversation. Mm -hmm. My question is, is, are there any other components of law in Michigan, maybe Ohio, that you've seen that we should be wary of that speak to that issue? And then <laughs> my other question with regard to ODNR is, um, uh, well, so Reuters just released a report that says that basically ODR, ODNR is very late in the way that they report their earning or the, the yield on different wells. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on ODNR and their transparency with respect to data. And then my final question was, oh, Mineral Management Service, are they the same people that had the Denver incident? The, the, okay. 
Anyway, can you just speak to the... To yeah, the I'll, I'll take a shot at the, the loophole question and then I'll perhaps turn it over for the ODNR stuff. Um, yeah, it happens. It's amazing. Um, in, in various laws, we have these carve-outs for you know whatever uh, interest is able to, um, to make that happen. You know, I'm involved in some work in the food and drug law where there's basically been a categorical exclusion given to drug makers to avoid an environmental assessment as long as they self-certify that they're not going to harm the environment. Um, they wrote that. Uh, the drug, <laughs> drug industry wrote that and, you know, part of the law. So, yeah, it happens quite a bit. Another example about water withdrawals, though, in Michigan, in our legislation implementing the Great Lakes Compact, we have this water withdrawal tool where if a user wants to pump more than 100,000 gallons a day on average, they have to run their proposed withdrawal through this, this tool. It's an online assessment tool. It spits out a response whether you get a green light or yellow light or red light. And when you get the yellow or red, you're going to have to do some more site-specific analysis. But um, interestingly, oil and gas development is exempted from the Michigan Water Withdrawal Act. Um, very similar to what we've seen in some of these other areas. So um, our Department of Environmental Quality has asked industry to go ahead, just go ahead and use the tool and, and make sure that your withdrawals are okay. But as an attorney, I wonder, well, what happens if, if they ultimately have a withdrawal that says, that the tool says you shouldn't make, um, and they've got that exemption? I mean, if I'm, if I'm their counsel, I'm just going to you know, say, hey, we're going to go ahead and do this, <laughs> do this uh, withdrawal. So it, it, it does happen quite a bit. Okay, I'll uh, just add quick, quickly to that, that some of us were, were talking over lunch about the exemptions for oil and gas, and I don't know where the guy who answered the, asked the question is over there. Um, but uh, if you look historically at the federal environmental statutes anyway, what you'll see is really a, a systematic exclusions and carve-outs for the oil and gas industry dating back to the 70s. And um, it's, you know, considering the fact that a lot of this stuff seems, it feels very, very new, um, looking back to when these ex exclusions uh, were put in place, it, it's an example of really incredible foresight and advanced planning <laughs> on the part of the oil and gas industry. Um, there's carve outs in, you know, you. Those of you in the room you know, know a lot about this can tell me more, but the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, RICRA, uh, uh, Emergency Planning, Community Right to Know, uh, where else? There, uh, it's carved out of the federal laws pretty much across the board. Um, and if when you read the language of the carve outs, they look like they were written for this stuff. Um, and you know, fracture, the fracturing isn't as new as a lot of people think it is. Uh, it was going on a long, you know, quite a while ago. Um, but yeah, you know, and the, the carve-outs are in the state laws as well because they largely mimic uh, the federal laws. So yes, they're, they're there and they're everywhere. Uh, okay, and the other question you asked was about uh, transparency uh, regarding data at ODNR. Uh, I guess I would have to say I don't know a lot about it and I don't want to tell you something that's not right. I don't have a lot of experience with that. I can tell you that they're not, there's not a lot required of ODNR to provide data. Um, but in terms of how, their level of cooperativeness, I don't know. I, I don't want to tell you something that I don't know personally. So. Thank you. Sir. Professor Fitzgerald, you had a slide called Decline Curves and Recompletion, so that production is shown as a, at a high level and then ebbs over a period of time and then goes back to the original level because the well is refracted. Is that what it, what it is? That Can is you talk a little bit more about that and what happens and how that's possible geologically? Well, um, I think that there, there are two things going on there. W one is if you have a well bore that's been constructed and you perforate it in some horizon or some uh, azimuth from the well bore, so one direction, okay, from, from the well bore, and then you fracture in that particular direction, you can always go back and add additional perforations or perforate at a different depth or perforate in a different direction and frack the other way. In fact, what uh, anecdotally what I've heard recently out of the Bakken is that they've started to space 
the fractures out more than they had been with the intent to return after they see some decline uh, and perforate in between the initial fractures to try to access more of that uh, reservoir rock over the course of time. Now, with regard to the graphic that I had there, as I say, that is a sort of a celebrity well uh, that Devin has down in, in the Barnett. I don't think that the evidence is in on whether or not that can be replicated repeatedly. But that is certainly a hope amongst uh, practitioners of, of unconventional extraction. And if I could just add on to that, I mean, if assuming we can answer a lot of the, the questions, at least that I have, about some of these regulatory gaps, um, being able to, to use that technology, I mean, if you already have a wellhead and you've already disturbed that area and you already have that development there, being able to get more productivity out of these wells, I think everyone agrees, makes a lot of sense. And being able to use that, that one platform, as it were, to, to do that um, and not have to drop wells in all around that, that area and, and further fragment habitat and that type of thing, it, it's a good, a good development. Um, you know, again, setting aside some other concerns that I, that I talked about earlier. Thank you. Ms. Radler? I wanted to um, ask uh, Heidi a question just about the, the, how we diagnose regulatory failure, because I think the premise in much of the talk is that the problem is, is internal conflict of interest within agencies. But we can look at agencies that don't have that internal conflict of interest being subject to regulatory capture. One of my favorite recent examples, the EPA promulgated a rule uh, just uh, a month and a half ago, um, uh, a, a renewable uh, biodiesel uh, component that's going to increase particulate emissions. And for those parts of the country, like Ohio, that are in non-attainment non for particulates, it's kind of odd to see the EPA promulgating a rule that will uh, be net non-beneficial non based on its own cost-benefit analysis uh, by increasing air pollution. And it doesn't have this conflict of interest. And no. we can also see other agencies, like, say, the FAA, that have a more, an even more express conflict of interest built into their mandate, where the FAA has a dual mandate to both improve air travel uh, safety, but also increase the volume of air travel, mm -hmm. um, that don't seem to have these problems. And so I, I'm, right. I'm wondering how you'd respond to the claim that the problem isn't agency conflict of interest, but traditional things like agency capture, uh, information problems, uh, incentive problems, uh, and that those are really where we need to look for for failure because that's going to, finding failure in the right place is how we're going to solve it. Good. I, I think you make a good point, Jonathan, that there are lots of reasons why agencies failure and conflict of interest may be one example of a reason why agencies can fail. And I think that uh, conflict of interest in this instance with respect to M MMS because of you know, the way they were operating was, was one problem. And I think I maybe moved too quickly through the others. And I think that the uh, agency capture, which I'm sure the law students who've had Professor Adler know, know what that is, is, is certainly um, a major issue here, and, but, but uh, described more by the revolving door example that uh, is what I said was a hard nut to, to crack. I mean, right here, when, you, when you're dealing with advances in technology like this, um, where does the expertise come from? It comes from the field. It comes from the people in the, the industries that are advancing technology. And so in order to uh, understand the technology and thereby do their job and regulate it, they rely on the industry. So it's a very tough problem. Um, and I think certainly as important as conflict of interest in this instance. Um, but you're right, fi figuring out why an agency is failing I is critical. I think in the MMS instance, there were a number of reasons for failure, not one of them probably controlling. But, um, yeah. Fair answer. Last question from this gentleman, and then we'll wrap up. My question is for Nick. My name is Stephen Chang. Um, you were addressing some of the concerns and were proposing or ha had thoughts to this idea of uh, having a new rule for 100% consumptive use. Has there been any thoughts as to having a rule which sort of meets the middle, you know, where the question isn't to drill or not to drill, uh, but rather has there been any proposals that you, th you think would be able to adequately meet the needs of the oil and gas companies while, you know, taking it into consideration the pact or the compact? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess um, I think there's a lot of room for 
technological advancements in the process itself to be able to use less water, first of all. Um, I don't know that those advancements will be made unless there's at least a nudge from regulation. Uh, I mean, frankly, if, if you can just drop in a groundwater well right near where you're going to do your fracking, or if you have a, a surface water body that's pretty close to get your water, it's, it's pretty cheap to do that. Um, if we're going to require them to use uh, gray water, reclaimed water, that's going to add to the, to the cost. So, I mean, I think that's where we may need to see. I don't know that 100% is the answer or 75% is the answer. My, my just, I guess, question that I threw out there is, um, this type of activity where we're using water that becomes contaminated and it's not just returned back into the basin or the aquifer, whatever the case may be, less of a little bit of consumptive use as most processes uh, involve, um, that I think that should be treated differently. And I, I don't have a great answer as to, you know, what percentage that should be. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Right. Isn't that part of the process for drilling, though? Isn't, don't you need to return the water into the well in order to extract more, from my understanding? Yeah, and a lot of it, it stays in there, stays in the well. So you'll, you'll have some that kind of comes out as part of the process, and then, um, but there will be fluid left in the well at the end of the operation. At least that's you know, my understanding of it. Yeah. All right, we need to wrap up. We have a 15-minute um, break with refreshments. Let's give our panelists uh, thank you. And I think the folks would, would want me to...